Well, good morning. My name is Daniel Van Cleve. I'm the young adult pastor here at Great Hills Baptist Church. I have spent the last week um, preaching revival services in Spokane, Washington, long ways from here. And so Sheree and I were investing in this, this church up there and had a blast doing that. Then we jumped on this train, as if that was not exhausting enough, and we jumped on a train in Seattle and rode down the west, west coast line all the way to San Francisco, toured San Francisco uh, yesterday, and caught a red eye back late last night. And so if I fall asleep I'm preaching my own sermon, I'm giving you permission to throw a hymn book at me. And yes, I did check and did not find any hymn books out there. So we cleared that. Um, and so uh, also we were able to celebrate this month 21 years of marital bliss. I, I think she's going to keep me. So it was a great, great time. So today is 20, 20 years, 11 months, and five days. So it's great. I'm still counting. So today I am tasked um, with the opportunity to identify biblical characteristics of the blessed family. Um, Pastor um, Jeffrey did an incredible job um, last week with the time change. We were able to catch um, some of that sermon, and we saw that a blessed life is lived in the light of the cross. And my favorite quote, in, in case you didn't get it last week, is, is this, blessing is not circumstantial. It's not circumstantial. He said, blessing is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. What a powerful word. Amen goes there, right? Yes. So what constitutes a, a blessed family? Is, is your family blessed this morning? You know, the family has been under attack since the Garden of Eden, and Satan has not let up in his relentless efforts to destroy family. U.S. Census Bureau backs this up in one way uh, with the number of um, couples or cohabitating situations have doubled in the past 10 years. Family is, is, is in the crosshairs and has been for some time. The number of homes with both spouses of each, each spouse of, of the child has dropped from 70 to 50%. Now 50% of homes do not have both dad and, and biological mom there. Family groups just drop significantly. We continue to grow numerically as a nation, but family is on the decline. Why? The average age of um, uh, marital, the, the ceremony, what's that thing, marriage? Yes, the average age that um, uh, young adults are getting married has, has risen in the past 50 years by 10 years. So many factors play a role um, in the moral slide of the family. And I don't believe that the traditionalist generation nor the baby boomers intended to contribute to the demise um, of, of the family, but they are the ones that allowed or either rather sent mom into the workplace. You can blame inflation, but moms, most moms have to work now to survive. 74% of American moms um, work. This requires more uh, awareness on, on the, the matter of family. It's, it's greater intentionality in parenting, relentless parenting, and makes for busy, 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 busy parents. And, uh, and we all know that the family does not thrive without parental presence. So in just a moment, we're going to look at four or five non-biblical ideas that, that produce bad parenting and that affect the family. And we're going to look at what an extraordinarily blessed family looks like. But before we look at the family, I, I wanted to make an announcement. I want to let you know this morning, in case you didn't already know, that there are no perfect families. Did you know this? Not a single one. Family is hard work. Marriage is even harder work. Uh, Sheree and I almost did not make it in the first year of our marriage because people were not talking about their problems. Uh, we were putting on the church mask and we were coming to an assembly and looking at all these couples that it just looked like they had the perfect relationship. And then once those masks become, began to come off, we started noticing that they look a lot like us. 
and that they were in marital conflict as well. They were trying to figure out how to communicate with each other. And I think that is a potential problem for us, is that we, we needed to know that. And, and once we found that out, once we saw that as a, as a young married couple, we were able to get help, and we were able to see that. Uh, family's messy. So this morning, um, I'm going to be transparent. I'm going to be I'm going to share some things that I've never shared uh, publicly before. And I'm going to do it because the Lord told me to do it. So I'm not going to make apology for it, and I'm not going to sugarcoat it. Um, but I was uh, raised in a, in a rather unhealthy family. I want you to know this this morning. I don't want you to see this guy that maybe looks devastatingly handsome and put together. <laughs> and um, at least that's what my wife tells me, and I don't listen to anybody else, so I'm good. Um, but just like us, my parents um, were not perfect, and um, they made terrible mistakes. My parents um, brought a ton of baggage into the relationship when they were married. Unresolved conflict, um, traumatic wounds, that, that, that this, these painful weights that they brought to the relationship. You see, 20 years before I was born, my grandfather... Um, set out to buy shoes for his two-year-old son, my dad, and came back with a fifth of whiskey and um, inebriated. And Grandma had said, no more or else. And so she sent him packing, and they were divorced. Uh, Ten years before I was born, my grandmother passed away in a tragic accident. So I, I, I never met her. She was Grandma Lucy. So my dad um, grew up in orphanages, foster homes, and I met my inebriated grandfather for the first time as a teenager. I saw him twice as a teenager. All I can remember is a drunk. Um, I cringed. I thought it was kind of cool at first, but then later on it just it really broke me up. But I cringed at the sight of the beer cans outside of his, his window where he would drink. The, the, the cans stacked four or five foot tall where he would drink and lift the window and chunk the can. Massive 12, 13, 14 foot round circle. That's what I remember of, of my grandfather. Growing up, uh, family was not a priority in, in our home, even in our home. And um, I, don't, I don't fault my parents. I think they did the best they, they probably could, maybe. But history tells no lies. I, I do believe they did they did their best. So moving on. In spite of the circumstances, um, my family was still blessed, right? I was born to seminary uh, students in Chattanooga, Tennessee. I grew up as, in, in Georgia as the son of a bivocational pastor. Dad worked two to three jobs to support his, his call to preach. My family did their best, I think, to provide. God took care of us. I remember my mother crying a lot. Uh, She explained away the bruises. Lived in 18, 18 homes by the time I was 15 years old. On career day, my buddies stood and said, I want to be a fireman, I want to be a police officer, I want to be an engineer. I, I stood and said, I want to be anything but a pastor. You see, I hated the thing that took my dad from me. Yes, other dads stepped in. Um, Sam Curry taught me to fish in his boat. Um, another, Danny Howell, taught me to ride a bicycle. Played catch with my neighbor. Never learned to tie a tie. I took encouragement um, from a television show host, the only man to ever tell me as a teenager, you can be somebody, was Bob Ross. Right? Painting little happy trees, and he said, you can do it too, because you're somebody. I just happened to believe him. I just happened to believe him. For years, I blamed the church. I remember the church questioning the abuse in our home, but they never did anything. Um, denial, fear, lies stood in the way. At least that's the way I saw it. At age 17, um, I did everything that I could do to not be at home, including sleeping in my car. I began to drink heavily. Um, almost every day of my 17-year-old life. 
tried to drown my sorrows. My dad had an affair. Parents called us together and said, you know, we're just not going to do this anymore. And they told us they were getting a divorce. And I learned who hurts the most in divorces. It's, it's the children. It was painful. It's hard um, to be pulled through that. Well, this morning, things are a little different. Praise the Lord for the grace of God that restores um, parents and restores those old mistakes and that things are different with my parents now. Um, but I stand here today having been pelted by the favor and the blessing of God. You see, 18 years ago, I decided, I made a decision to make Jesus Christ the Lord and Savior of my life. And I went through bondage breakers and determined to not be victimized by my past, but allow God to shape my future and let him take my mess and make a message out of it. And let him take that stuff that he freed me from this generational curse, and I'm not going to repeat by the grace of God what was ingrained in me. I'm an extraordinarily blessed man. My past, the experience, drives Cherie um, and I to invest in families, to invest in young people. And I would say this and throw this out. Maybe you um, are in your first years of marriage. Maybe you've been married 10 years. Maybe you, you, you bring some of those things that I've just talked about, and, and just hearing that hurts you. I had to call my mother and ask permission. 40 minutes later, 40 minutes later, I could not console her. So I know there's hurt. There, there's, there's things there. Maybe you bring that um, to this room this morning. I'm excited to share with you a message about a blessed family. And we're going to look this morning at, at Psalm 1. And it's my desire to identify what constitutes a blessed family and how we can obtain more blessing. We're going to look at this idea of extraordinarily blessed and what it means to be extraordinarily blessed. Um, Psalm 1 is, is basically a, the Hebrew, part of the Hebrew songbook, about 150 songs. And we're not sure who wrote Psalm 1. Um, and, and, and I want us to read it together this morning. So if you would stand, it's going to be on the screens. Let's stand together and let's audibly, let's audibly read the Word of God. And the version that we're going to read is, is on the screens. J. Vernon McGee says the theme of this passage is, is about two men, uh, two ways, and two destinies. So let's read together. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scoffers. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers." The wicked are not so, but are like the shaft which the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. You may be seated. That is the word of God. So what does it mean to be blessed? Um, we want blessing. We do not desire to live a cursed life. But we throw this word blessing around as something that we receive, maybe that's undeserved, maybe this gift. And, and, but I wonder, is that really the whole of what blessing really is? When we pray... We pray, Lord, bless this situation. Lord, bless my family. A am, I, am I asking God, when I say bless me, am I asking him for more money? Am I asking God, when I ask him to bless me, am I asking him to take away my problems? Or maybe I'm asking him to make me taller or, or give me perfect health or maybe help my kids not to marry idiots. I don't know. What are we asking for when we say, bless us, Lord? Are my blessings solely circumstantial? I think we saw last week that they are not. I'm blessed whether I feel like I'm blessed or not. 
um, whether I get what I want or not, not because of a situational, circumstantial thing. Our society says that we are blessed when we have those things, though. Um, If you are to look at social media and search hashtag blessed, the number one thing you find is is really, it's kind of cool, you find uh, pictures of family, really good stuff. Kid playing in the park, hashtag blessed. You know, I have my, my BFF or whatever, my bride, blessed. Um, you see other things, getting something, like getting that raise. I saw several, and I looked at it several days. Um, and, and, and one thing that you will find are awkward pictures of, of people that are satisfied the way their body looks, blessed, not so exciting, but got a shiny new car, blessed, or the tree fell, didn't hit the car, didn't hit the house, I'm blessed. Am I saying that these things are not indicative of a blessed life? No, but they do not make up uh, they do not make up a blessed life. That's not the root of it. Um, write this down if you're taking notes. You have that little note sheet. This is not one of the blanks, but write down, I am blessed because of who I am, not by what I have. I am blessed because of who I am, because of who Jesus has made me, not by what I have. The greatest blessing we'll see this morning is in who we are, not our cool stuff or the ingredients in the mix. Another thought is when we say we are blessed, I have to think of it backwards. What, what could take place to render us not blessed? What, what would happen or what would have to happen for us to not be blessed? So as I'm looking at social media, I did find Jesus' Twitter. Yes, it's out there. Um, I found it. Um, I don't have a Twitter, but I found you can Google search and looking at, at, at Twitter. But I wonder if Jesus did really have a Twitter in his day, what would, what would Jesus tweet? Think about it. Um, I don't think he would have a Twitter. Um, some people don't need to have a Twitter, maybe. Just throwing that out there. But what would Jesus uh, tweet if he did? Um, Jesus, regarding Matthew 5... Matthew 5 says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Jesus' tweet would say, empty, no personal inward ability to please God, hashtag blessed. Blessed are those who mourn. Jesus' tweet might say, feeling grief, massive sorrow, blessed. Blessed are the meek. The tweet would be, humbled with a heart position low, blessed. Or, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. A strong desire to please God. Hashtag blessed. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Harassed. Attacked for my religious belief. Blessed. We don't get this idea of material possessions or perfect perfect circumstances bringing about Jesus' words here. These things are typically associated with with poverty or or with with need, with trial. Another thing you might should write down is, blessing is the spiritual benefits of being joined by faith to Jesus. That is free. Blessing is the spiritual benefits of being joined by faith to Jesus. If you search this word, um, ashle, in in the Hebrew, or makarios in, in Greek, it means fully satisfied. Blessed means fully satisfied. And that satisfaction produces joy, joy in the Lord. And that satisfaction in turn brings about ultimate happiness. Um, the first blank in your notes that we're going to look at in Psalm 1 is, is what does it mean to be blessed? What does it mean to be blessed? And so right under that, ultimate blessing and it's on this screen, is being fully satisfied in anything that God gives. Ultimate blessing is being satisfied in anything that God gives. It's not circumstantial. Um, Genesis 12, in verse 3, God made a promise to Abraham. He said, I'll bless those who bless you. And he goes on to say, in all, in you all, the families of the earth shall be blessed. The Apostle Paul talked of this in Romans 9, 10, 11. When he, he spoke of us being grafted in. We're blessed because we're a part 
of this family. We have an opportunity to be in the family of God. We're not born into that. We have the opportunity to surrender our lives to Jesus and to be a part. That's a blessing in and of itself. Um, it is the blessing of the Lord that leads to repentance. It's His grace that draws the lost heart. Everyone's blessed. Everyone is favored in some regard by God. Blessed is being at peace in a resolve that, that, that God is enough. God is, is plenty. It's, it's, a, it's a content position where no additives are needed. Um, Psalm 1, the extraordinarily blessed man um, does not do three things, and there's a couple things that he does. So let's look at Psalm 1. Um, the psalmist uses three trilogies of expressions to describe this blessed man. He employs this metaphor with three units that progressively get more and more intense. It's like a slope here. Some call it Satan's graduation plan. It's a metaphor of a walker who, who is walking and, and navigating carefully this path, but he listens to the ungodly, or he's tempted to listen to counsel that is not of God's Word. And then he stops, and, and he, he, he carouses at the wrong place and stands with the wrong crowd, and then finally finds himself among mockers, amongst wrong, the wrong crowd, p sitting in bitterness and making mockery of God's Word. And so we're going to look at an extraordinarily blessed family. That's number two, is a, 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 how can a family be extraordinarily blessed? How can this happen? And um, I believe, if you want to write this down, take, we need to take our counsel from God's Word. Extraordinarily blessed family takes their counsel from God's Word. They don't walk in that way, refusing to follow the flight of those who do not follow Jesus, rejects the influence and those influences around us, and, and focuses on what is thus said the Lord. Choose who you listen to. I wonder how many things, and I, I've really wrestled with this message. How many things have I allowed, or what situations or circumstances in my life have, have built this platform for myself personally to be led in an ungodly fashion, to be influenced by this talk on this pathway that I'm not supposed to be on. And so four things that um, I want us to, to jot down, if you, if you have a pencil. Um, one of the things that I think we do when we refuse to follow the counsel of God's Word is we, we, we outsource our responsibilities. We, we can outsource. God says we should own our, we should own our parenting, parents, we should on our walk with Christ as a faithful amb ambassador. And I think for, for parents, and I am one, um, any parents in the room, a few parents, everybody in the room has parents or had parents. Um, parents are not uh, perfect. But there was a critical shift in the 50s or the, the late 40s when television came on the scene. In 1948, less than half a percent of homes had a television. In 10 years, that number jumped to 82.2% of homes in the U.S. have a television. The influences began to, to creep in as, as, as families grew and some parents maybe not home. And, um, and it, you can even be home and not engage in parenting, by the way. Um, that's really easy, especially with media as, as, as prevalent and available as it is today on an iPad or sell a device or whatever. It's everywhere. It's everywhere. And no one can do the parent's job but, but parents. Um, a survey says that children from 2 to 11 years old watch over 24 hours of television a week or, or, or on a device, uh, 24 hours a week. You think that's high. What about um, adults ages 35 to 49? 33 hours a week of, of these influences. Um, not all bad, but it's interesting to look at it. So I, I did the math. If you are awake 16 hours a day, right? Some of us may be a little longer. Um, adults spend two days at, at that uh, watching TV each week, 104 days a year, 37.9% of their lives engaged in something other than family. And if you haven't noticed, um, most of that something, if not 
upper 99% of it is not healthy. Uh, it's hard to find healthy content. Um, one of the most famous and popular rating shows is Good Luck Charlie. Um, our home has watched it. It's funny. It's hilarious. It's sassy kids. Um, and it's probably one of the closest things to a family series. I mean, I grew up watching Andy Griffith, clean TV, but there's, there's no nuclear family model in An Andy Griffith. You don't see it. Um, but here are these sassy kids. Um, they, they kind of have this dysfunctional reality uh, where the kids try to manipulate their parents or they're dishonoring, disrespectful and, and this, this influences us. Don't outsource our responsibilities. Step into that. Uh, as parents, we have, to, as leaders in our family, we have to step in and say, hey, time out. This is not healthy. Now the television isn't as, as popular as a device. And I wish this morning I could bring you my results of lots of research as I'm trying to locate um, a, a screen time app I'm, I've tried several, and I haven't made up my mind yet. I'll post it on Facebook when I find the one that I'm going to stick on. But there are social media apps. Uh, students are going to hate me for saying this, but there are social media apps that, that allow you to set time, how much time they can spend on Instagram. And then after several hours, or maybe you set it for your really smart parent and you, you don't want them on Instagram for like 12 hours a day, um, you set it for 30 minutes, 31 minutes, it shuts Instagram off. They can't get on it. Yeah, you love that, don't you? Screen time, S-C-R-E-E-N-T-I-M-E. -E -E. There are many, many apps. The good ones, you have to pay a whopping $5 a month, um, which is nothing comparatively to, to the protections there. You can set the phones to go off at 10 o'clock at night, come back on at 6 a.m., they can even use their alarm. You know those excuses? Well, Dad, I need my alarm clock. And you're seeing posts at 1 and 2 and 3 a.m. I need my alarm clock. Well, they'll come back on in time. They can even use it. And then maybe they, they turn off during school hours. Oh, check this out. You can set the numbers that you want them to call. So they can't call Johnny, but they can call Daddy. <laughs> love that. I love it. Screen time. Screen time. It is, it is great. Don't outsource your responsibilities. I, I can't do that and thrive as a, as a healthy, healthy family. The world teaches ownership. Let's move fast. God teaches stewardship. I don't own my family. My children, who are incredible um, kiddos, they're, they're, they are my responsibility, but they're, they're, not, they're not mine. I'm a manager in, in the home. It's a freeing thought to know that I'm not going to be held accountable for their, their decisions and their mistakes. I'm going to be held accountable for my parenting and how I respond and how I lead them. I would encourage you to remember this. Act, do not react. Make up your mind. How, make up your mind. I'm going to exemplify a Christ-like attitude regardless of how I'm approached. Well, bless God, she just has this nasty, nasty tone. Well, you know what? Um, I did too, and God did not destroy me. So maybe I'm to, in love, approach that um, parent in humility. The goal is not for me to glorify myself. The goal is for me to glorify God. So stewardship, steward your kids, your life, your home. And then the third thing, the world says compare your kids to others. I, I wish we could, wish we could spend time on this, but 2 Corinthians 10, 12 says those comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. We should not compare ourselves to, to each other. Just not a healthy thing. And I've seen this crush teenagers' lives and young kiddos' lives. Um, don't compare our, ourselves among ourselves. And then fourth... Um, don't parent the problem as much as you parent to, to prevent the problem. There are ways that we do this in our home through devotions and prayer time. I wish I could tell you that every day my family and I sit down and read God's Word together. We do not do it every day. But is, is one day a week better than no days a week? Sit down, um, open up Proverbs for, for the, the, the day of the, the, the chapter of the day of the month and just and read it and allow God's Word to influence and to help. We need all the help we can get in our family. 
Um, I was talking to a, a dad of eight um, children a couple months ago. And I said, well, how's it going? And he said this, the longer I am a parent, this is the first of the year, the longer I'm a parent, the more and more I realize that I have no clue what I'm doing, right? We need God's Word. Um, the other thing is we don't parent to make our kids happy. Um, it's, it's just not what God's called us to do. We are called um, to be holy. Holiness is the objective. A blessed family listens to God's Word. Got it? Also, a blessed family uh, does not stand in the way of sinners. Extraordinarily blessed family refuses to compromise their position. Notice the progression. There's a road that he doesn't walk on. Now he's encouraged to not stop. Don't position yourself in vulnerability or stop where you can be influenced and be lured in by ungodly counsel. The blessed family positions themselves for this. And then we see he does not sit in the seat of scoffers. This Hebrew word less is to not position yourself. I'm sorry, the Hebrew word less is someone who jeers, mocks, or treats someone with content, to call out in derision. The extraordinarily blessed family does not take communion with just anyone. 1 Corinthians 15, says, Bad company corrupts good manners. We have to be careful with this. Who we take a break with, who we sit with. Yes, we need to be sitting with people, but we need to play on our own turf, and we need to have, be rooted and solid, grounded in God's Word. Then we see in verse 2, His delight is in the law of the Lord. The Word of God is the extraordinarily blessed family's plumb line for truth. I'm going to hear from God and what is thus said the Lord, not how I feel or what I think. He says he delights in the law of the Lord. This word delight is a feeling of extreme pleasure, satisfaction in God's word. The psalmist described it, Psalm 119, 109, he said, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. What do we delight in? What, what do we take pleasure in? Are, are we satisfied in ungodly counsel or in God's word? I want to tell you one of the greatest things about Texas here, since I'm a new Texan, the greatest thing is the, uh, the readily available Bluebell ice cream. I'm just being real. I delight in that stuff. Um, it is, it, where I'm from, it's, it would probably sell better than crack cocaine in the hood. I mean, that's where I'm from in South Georgia. Bluebell ice cream is the stuff. I delight in it. My favorite is, is butter pecan. They're, it's perfect. It's perfect. The pecans are roasted to perfection. People try to bring other ice cream to me and say, here, try this, and it's just garbage. Nothing compares once you've had bluebell ice cream. So I love the creamy texture. It's not this gritty, like all this healthy ice cream where you put it in your mouth and it tastes like salt or some sort of sugar, like it tears the root. No, this bluebell. I want bluebell right now. And, and I, I mean, the way you eat bluebell, if you eat it right, you have to have four or five scoops. Now, I can eat a half a gallon in one weekend. If you, don't prove, if you want me to prove it, bring it by. I'll take it. I'll send you a before and after pick. And I'm, I'm stingy with it. And one of the main reasons I started liking butter pecan is that none of my family likes butter pecan. So, <laughs> except Cherie, she... She will eat butter pecan when I tell her the truth. You know, there's actually a scoop or two left. I have been known to um, forget that it's there until I want my butter pecan. But nothing will satisfy my cravings um, for bluebell ice cream except bluebell ice cream. I delight in it. I'm just going to be real. Um, it's, it's better than breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Bluebell, bluebell, bluebell. Um, I think this is what the psalmist is saying when he says that the extraordinarily blessed man delights in God's Word. It, it's, it, it, it satisfies a craving in my life that nothing else will. Mm. The extraordinarily blessed person does not take their counsel from anywhere uh, but God's Word. Take your counsel, counsel from God's Word. Uh, Matthew 22, uh, 37 says, To love the Lord your God, we know this verse, with all our heart, all our soul, and all our mind, and our neighbor 
as ourself. This is good counsel. And, and I'm to love the Lord first and foremost in my home as a father, as a husband. Um, and the greatest thing that I can do for my family is to let them see me love the Lord first. And the second greatest thing I can do for my family is to let them see me love my wife second. And it's a great, great thing. And those two run hand in hand. Um, Luke, Luke eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. And, and this is something that, um, you know, I'm, I bounced down a little too far. I'm going to back up because I did not finish um, this up here. So give me just a second. We um, flew in late and got in bed at 2 a.m. And I counted 11 hours sleep in the last three days. So don't throw anything. I'm moving. I got it. Love, love, your, love your children. Pray with your spouse. I want to talk about this just for a second. As, as, I, as I love my spouse, as I love my family, I'm to pray with them. And um, one of the ways I've shared this before that Shri and I started a prayer life together in 2013 by just simply starting to pray. Whoever leaves the house first comes and finds the other person and, and we just put our heads together and pray a short and simple prayer. And that has led to an amazing prayer life. Pray with your spouse. Date your family. Date your family. I'm supposed to be off on Friday. And so what I do on Friday, every Friday, if I'm in town, and if I'm not going to be in town, I will try to set another date for it. Um, I take one of my kids to lunch. It's important to me. If I fail at everything else that week, and I sit down and I tune into the heart of my son or my daughter, I feel like it's been a successful week. If I listen to them and I love them, and yours may not be Friday, it might be Thursday night or Sunday afternoon, but date your kids, date your spouse. Devotions, we talked about that. The um, extraordinarily blessed man meditates on God's Word. It says day and night. He chews on it. He regurgitates God's Word, processing God initiative 24-7. And we see that in verse 2. Um, sometimes we chew on the wrong things. And my son gave me permission to share this story. Um, he, he, at 10 months old, it was quite an interesting little fellow. And Cherie left him in his room just for a minute or two, ran to use the restroom. And when she came out, she met Joe crawling on the floor to her. And she noticed that he had gotten into some candy or something, but there's this red saliva just coming out the sides of his mouth, and it's all over his onesie, and there's like some drips and going out of the room, trailing to his room. And, and she, she, she runs over to, 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 to test and see what's going on, and the initial, initial thing she noticed is she heard crunching, and this, did, this wasn't good. And so she reached in his mouth and scooped out a chunk of glass out of his mouth. And he pitched a fit. He was not happy. He pulled back and he began to fight her. This little 10 month old kid was having a blast. I know, we love what we love. I know, how dare you reach in my mouth and pull this out of my mouth? I'm having a good time. And Joe fought her. And she pulls all this glass out and has to really just pry it out and, and, and takes off to his room and notice that he bit his nightlight bulb in two. And so she put the pieces together and, and was quite confident that she had them all, praise the Lord. This little dude, what, what stuck out to me is he thought he had something that was good for him. He thought he was chewing on something that would bring him lasting satisfaction. He thought what was in his mouth that seemed good was something that was going to make him a blessed, young, little 10-month-old man. But it wasn't. Unchecked, it was going to kill him. Unchecked, it could potentially um, kill him, definitely harm him. I wonder what we chew on sometimes. I wonder what we meditate on. Uh, the extraordinarily blessed man uh, does not chew on just anything or meditate on just anything. He's focused on God's Word. There's a love and a delight for God's Word and a processing of God's Word that forms and shapes his life. 
This is what an extraordinarily blessed person is. Listen faster. Verse 3. He's like a tree. He's like a tree planted by the rivers of water. And I have a picture of a tree. I stopped and snapped a picture of this tree um, on my run beside the Spokane River. And here's what I noticed with this tree. This tree's massive. It's big. And, and, and what I noticed was, is this tree is alive with life. And, and it, it, it went up and went up so big I couldn't have put it all in, in the frame from where I was standing. But as big around as this tree was, I couldn't have wrapped my arms halfway around it. But what I noticed that stunned me was none of the other trees around that tree was as big as this tree. God's Word says He's like a tree planted by streams of water. And it hit me. This guy is right beside, literally eight feet from water, from his nourishment, from what brings him satisfaction, what brings him what he needs to be blessed. He's planted there. The other trees were small. Really, I could reach my arms around him. This guy's massive and big. A blessed life is like this. He's planted. Planted by whom? God. That's so beautiful. By streams of water, he's positioned for success. He has plenty of nourishment, and the supply is not going out. It's there. Um, he also yields his fruit in his season. So much we could say there. Um, produces fruit. A result of his life being blessed is more blessing, more fruit. A lot could be said there. His leaf does not wither. So why does God bless us? Why would God bless me? Why would God bless you? First of all, I would say, um, just by a side note, is when we um, feel like we lose often in life, we think based on our timeline that something's not working right, sometimes we will perceive it to be loss or we'll perceive it to be a curse or bad. Maybe it's God bringing about something better. Maybe it's God doing something that he can only do that way. And, and, it, and I don't like it at times. I, I don't like coming home at 1 o'clock in the morning and the air conditioning being out in our home and it's 85 degrees in the house and I don't, I don't, yes, I did the same thing when, when I, I just cried. You know, who wants to be in a hot mess in a, in a room like that? C.S. Lewis said, when we lose one blessing, another is most unexpectedly given in its place. God is faithful. Why does God bless us? He blesses us, I think, for two reasons and definitely not in this order. He blesses us to be a blessing to others. There's so many people on the sidelines watching us, whether we realize it or not. We have the potential for the fruit of our blessed lives to impact our surrounding and our community. He blesses us to bless, bless others. And I think the main reason that he blesses us is to bring him glory, to bring him honor. Whether you feel blessed or not, church, we are blessed. We are extraordinarily blessed when we give ear and attention to God's Word. Let's prioritize God's Word. Let's see God do in us what God desires to do in us. Um, I want us to enter a time of, of invitation, a time of response. And so if you would bow your heads and close your eyes just for a second. I want you to engage God and just take just a few minutes like this. How is, what is God doing in your life right now? Just in the quietness of your heart, if you would create this bubble and just bow your head, close your eyes, and just create this, this little two-foot bubble around just you and God and, 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 and wrap your mind around your reality. What is He doing in you right now? You feel blessed? Well, you are blessed. Are you extraordinarily blessed? Maybe not. Maybe so. You can be. Take him at his promises. Right now, just in the quietness of your heart, just ask God to begin to speak to you. Ask God to be able to just begin to move in your heart. And I want us to enter this time of response. It would be a terrible thing for us to come and hear God's word and leave the same and not be changed. Every time I open this book, 
I'm impacted. God moves and God touches my life. Will you be moved and touched by him this morning? I'm going to pray for us, and I want to challenge you in a couple of ways. I, I want to ask you that regardless of how you feel, to begin a time of thanksgiving, of acknowledging God, confessing your need for him. And Christians just begin to praise God and thank God right where you're at, even before this invitation starts. Maybe you want to come to the altar in just a moment and take a knee and say, God, I don't feel blessed, but I know I'm blessed. Thank you. for Help me to be more appreciative for your blessing. Maybe you're here this morning and you say, Daniel, this idea of God and God loving me and that decision that you made 18 years ago to surrender your life to God, I've never done that. Can I beg of you this morning to give your all to Jesus? Can I beg of you this morning to make the best decision that you have ever made and to go all in with a creator that will take you just like you are? He is not looking for us to clean our lives up and to come to him. He's looking for us to come to him and he cleans our lives up. He does the work. If he didn't do that, I would not be standing here this morning. I would be another statistic in a very, very dark place. He is mighty to save. Would you be rescued by him? And so I beg of you this morning, I'm gonna pray. Would you move? Would you move across this room and come forward? Take one of the pastors by the hand. I'm going to be up here. Pastor Ross, Nate, Pastor Jeffrey, we would love to talk with you about the way the Lord is moving in your heart. Father, thank you so much for your love for us. Thank you so much for your rescue, your great plan. God, I pray that we would know who we are this morning, that we would be found in the center of your will blessed, encouraged, strengthened to do, to be a part of a work that you do in and through us. We love you. We trust you. Move in this place. In Jesus' name we pray. Would you stand with me and you move as the Lord leads.